Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Chaco Culture National Historical Park, also known simply as Chaco Canyon. I'm in northwestern New Mexico. I've been here once before, several years ago. I made a video about it. Had a great time here. There's uh, lots of interesting stuff to see and do here if you're a fan of Native American history and, and architecture and ruins and all that good stuff. And uh, I've come back to basically do the things that I didn't do here last time. Starting with the cemetery that is just a short walk from the parking lot here. And the one we're interested in is this one. This guy right here, Richard Wetherill. He was essentially the first non-Native American guy to come here and start digging up the, the ruins and, and he sold off pottery to museums and, and that sort of thing. And uh, some people say that he was kind of the, the father of archaeology in this region and some say that he was just basically a, a grave robber. So I'll leave that for you to decide. He was actually killed here. So he had like a, a ranch or a homestead here in the canyon and he was killed under mysterious circumstances by a Navajo man in this area. And on the wall of the canyon here, we've got some pictographs. At least I thought they were pictographs. Now that I've zoomed in, that might be just some sort of natural red seepage. Anyway, let's get back on the main trail here. Here's our man, by the way, this is Richard Wetherill. And it says here that complaints from archeologists and universities halted his activities at Chaco and led to the creation of our nation's first law protecting antiquities. From where I'm parked here, and I am the only one here, by the way, which is nice. From here, there are trails in multiple directions. You can see a ruin right here, the walls of a ruin right here. Off to the left, this was the little path to the cemetery, which is right here. And the way I'm going is in this direction. There's a hike that I'm doing, a trail that I'm following for a few miles to the main thing that I want to see today. Chaco Canyon, this area, is known for its great houses, and these are Native American dwellings, home to hundreds of rooms and thousands of people. These were very large buildings, large complexes, basically the equivalent of cities, small cities. And there were several of these great houses throughout the area here. And this area really thrived from about 900 to about 1100 AD. So the the things that we'll be seeing today, these ruins and other things, are about a thousand years old. This first ruin that you come to along the trail is called Kin Kletso. It is one that I talked about in my previous video, so I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but it is known for its distinct masonry style. It has bigger, bigger blocks, bigger stones, bigger bricks than some of the other great houses in the area. And this is a layout of what it would have looked like. These, these round circles are kivas, which were ceremonial and religious and just kind of communal gathering areas, and then lots of rooms. And this probably would have been a couple stories tall, like two or three stories. This trail that I'm hiking on is the longest trail in the park, and it goes out to a couple of things in particular that I'm interested in seeing, but it does pass by some smaller ruins and other sites in the meantime. This is one of those. This is a kind of small, great house called Casa Chiquita, and it was at its heyday in about 1100, from about 1100 to 1150. Another one of the little sites along the way is this, the Petroglyph Trail. This is a trail that just parallels the main trail, so here's the main trail, and the Petroglyph Trail just stays along the cliffs here and goes along for a little while and then meets back up with the main trail here. So let's go check it out, see what we can find. Can you see that large horse? It's like 
three feet across, kind of superimposed on top of and among the other rock art. This is obviously a much later addition because the Native Americans didn't have horses until the Spanish came along. That was fun and pretty interesting. There were no real standout figures there, like that wasn't a world-class stretch of rock art or anything, but taken together as a whole, definitely worth the slight detour. And I'm now back on the, uh, on the main trail here. And it was interesting to see the, the variety of, of things over there. Some clearly Chacoan, you know, thousand-year-old rock art some newer stuff, probably like 18, 1900s, probably Navajo in origin, and then also European inscriptions and dates. I saw some in Spanish over there, so yeah, pretty interesting and worth the, worth the very slight detour. You probably don't need to visit it, you know, on the way there and back, but on, you know, one of the legs of your out and back journey, definitely worth the little, uh, the little slight detour there. I have to cross this little creek here and it's gonna be so cold. It's it's a cold morning. Oh Ooh. Ah. That is very unpleasant. Ah. And my feet are coated in goopy mud now, so I need to wash them off in the stream, which isn't, isn't gonna be easy. Can I stand on one foot and put my sock on? And then put the shoe on. Oh. Oh. Okay, that worked. Now the other foot. Well, that was fun. Onward and upward. Just past the creek crossing back there, you get to a cliff and the trail goes along this cliff for a ways. And there's something on this cliff that I really is the reason for me coming back. Something that I've wanted to see for years, didn't have time to see the last time I was here. There are some small petroglyphs on the cliff. Nothing too, too crazy. There are some underneath this little overhang here too. And we've got more right here. And these look properly old. I believe that these are a thousand years old. And what looks like a footprint on that far left side, and I don't know what those are in the top right. Little alien looking guys. Now those are all petroglyphs, meaning they've been pecked or scratched into the rock. But another form of Native American rock art are pictographs, and those have been painted on the rock. And here are arguably some of the most interesting, maybe even the single most interesting pictograph I've ever seen, and that I think exists in the Western US. And that is right, if we zoom way in on the underside of this little overhang here, next to some bird nests, you see three figures there. So at the top, there is a handprint. Below that, there is what looks like a moon. Beautiful, I don't think I've ever seen a moon like that before. But the real interesting one is that bottom left one. And experts believe that that is a supernova. This is called the supernova pictograph. I think I mentioned earlier that Chaco was really at its height in around the 1800s to 1100s and a little bit beyond that. And there was actually a supernova recorded on July 5th, 1054. And that fits right in to that time period. I don't know where exactly that date came from. I'm guessing probably like Chinese or Middle Eastern astronomers.
Isn't that incredible? We can actually put a, an exact date, an exact day to the events depicted right there. It makes the people who made this a little bit more real, you know, like these were actual people who lived, who observed, who saw things, who felt things, and this is what they decided to record. Just fascinating. Also, I was worried at first that I might not be able to find it on this big cliff here, or that it might be hard to see in the daylight or something, but that's not really a problem. There's a huge sign that says Supernova Pictograph pointing up to the little panel. And that's, I mean, that's a good 15 or 20 feet off the ground, too. That's, that's impressive. And it's a good thing it was painted on the underside there. Otherwise, I, I'm sure the, the centuries of sun and rain would, would cause that to become all faded and hard to see. So, so cool. That supernova is the main thing that I wanted to see on this trail and even the main thing that I wanted to see today, so I'm happy. But the trail does keep going here for another about eight tenths of a mile. And like I said, this is the longest trail in the, in the park here. And I think total round trip distance is like seven and a half miles, something like that. I have been recording it on my phone, on my GPS, so I'll be able to tell you exactly once I get to the end here. And it took me about an hour and a half to get to the supernova. And I think that even if you wanted to hike just to that and not continue beyond, totally worth it. That is a singularly unique thing. Like I've, I've been to probably hundreds of rock art panels. I've seen thousands of individual figures and glyphs and everything. And that is probably the most unique one that I've ever seen. And we finally made it after two hours, 13 minutes of hiking, covering 4.15 miles. We've made it to the end of the trail. These are the ruins of the third largest Chaco and Great House in the area. This one is called Penasco Blanco. And at its peak, it had 300 rooms and 17 kivas, which again, are those circular subterranean ceremonial and gathering places. And this is unexcavated. And so it is in a sort of natural state of, I was going to say preservation, but decay also works, I think. I guess that's sort of a glass half empty, half full kind of thing, right? Preservation, decay, both sides of the same coin. But this spot is kind of on top of a, a hill overlooking the area. The trailhead where I started is way out here off in the distance and then the trail followed along these cliffs and then kind of cut across the valley. And that's where I had to cross the creek, which is called Chaco Wash, which isn't running all the time, by the way. That's just a thing that happens after storms and periods of lots of rain like we've been having here recently. And then the supernova is like down over here below the, the bluff and then the trail comes over this way. And the people at this great house built dams. There have been evidence of dams in Chaco Wash down there and also irrigation ditches going to, to other parts of the valley here. So anyway, let's explore a little bit. I look at a wall like this and you can see just how many hundreds or thousands of rocks have been stacked up to create this wall. And then you multiply that by the thousands of walls that would have been in a, in a great house like this. And you multiply that by however many numbers of great houses there were. And I mean, we're talking millions of stones. That is insane. You can see some of the old timbers down in there. And on this neighboring wall, you can still see some of the, the wooden lintels above the, what would have been, I guess, windows. Still in place. 
Check out this keyhole door or window or whatever that is behind me. That is so neat. But anyway, talking about the, the wood, returning to the wood here, that is actually how they are able to, to date these structures. So by using tree ring dating, they were able to figure out that this was built, or at least these trees were taken down, were harvested uh, in around 1060. And then uh, the building continued through the early 1100s. Here's one of those kivas, again, one of those circular underground structures. You can see that curved edge, that curved wall along there. And you might be thinking, okay, if there were thousands of people here in this area for hundreds of years, what happened to them? Where did they go? I think there's some debate about that, but the consensus seems to be that there was basically just a huge drought in this region, in the entire Four Corners region, basically. And that lasted for years and years, and that just forced people to abandon these amazing places that they had built and go find greener pastures. These rooms that are along this wall here, assuming these were rooms that people lived in, slept in, and not like storage rooms, are about eight feet deep, maybe about twice that across. Not very big. What an amazing place. Also, very sad, I think. Like you think of just all of, all of the, the everything that went into not only building a place like this, but living in a place like this. And then you think about how this place has been silent for a millennium, basically, and it's just sad. Yeah, that, I wasn't expecting to feel that, but um, that is the, the primary thing that I'm feeling. Again, just like a, a civilization gone is, is the, the phrase, the thought that keeps running through my mind. I'm going to head back now. There is one thing that I wanted to show you that's like a couple hundred feet down the trail from, from the ruins here. So let's uh, let me have a snack and drink some water and then I'll go show you guys that. And check this out. This isn't what I wanted to show you guys. I just stumbled across this. We have a little collection of pot shirts here, pottery pieces. Wow. And a lot more pieces over here. A couple dozen pieces. I mean, there must be millions of pieces of broken pottery in this area. And I love seeing them because, again, it's easy to forget about the actual people who are here. You look at these walls and it's almost like they're, they're the cliffs that are over there, you know? They, they seem like part of the landscape, like these have been here forever. But you see the, the rock art, you see the, the pottery, and you remember, oh, these didn't just spring up. You know, these walls didn't just spring up here. These were made by the same people who made that rock art, who made that pottery. And that's always uh, something that I need to keep remembering when I come to these places, and so I wanted to share that with you guys also. Anyway, back down the trail a couple hundred feet to those other things that I wanted to show you guys. So the last time I was here, I did a hike over that way called the Pueblo Alto Loop Trail. And along that trail, there were some, some fossils in the sandstone along the trail, and they were trace fossils. I think they were worm tunnels, if I remember right. And I think I found the same kind of thing here. I think these right here are the filled in worm tunnels, or if they weren't worms, there was some kind of small invertebrate. I think this is basically the, the creepy crawly version of dinosaur tracks. They made these tunnels, these tubes in the ground, and then they were filled in. We can still see them today. We have this right here and another one over here. I might be completely wrong. These might just be some, you know, mineral deposit in the rock, but I'm pretty sure that's what they are. Yeah, they're all over this, this area, this section here and right here. Neat.
afternoon. I've found a campsite. It is several hours later. It is a weird campsite. I've never camped at an oil well before, but here we are. The sky is incredibly threatening, but so far it uh, seems like the rain is holding off. There are several of these pumps in the area and I've chosen to camp at this one because this is the only one, or at least the closest one, the easiest one to access that is not actively pumping. The one I can see over there is going up and down. I can hear and see some sort of like refinery or factory or something over there. It's kind of a low rumble and a hum, so not ideal camping conditions, but as I've said recently in these last couple of videos, beggars can't be choosers. Out here there's a lot of tribal land and state land and the camping situation is, is a little bit complicated as far as public lands go. But this is BLM land, this is public land, so I should be okay. But I've had kind of a rough several hours. Let me fill you in here. So, on the hike back to the car, I dropped a shoe into the creek as I was crossing, and so that was kind of a disaster. My shoe and my sock were completely wet. Not a huge deal, but you know, didn't help things. And then once I got back to my car, it wouldn't start. Now, I didn't tell you this because I was gonna mention it at the end of the video, but my car also didn't start this morning. And so, like I would turn the key and nothing, not even a click, just turn the key and it was dead, completely dead. I've had issues for the last couple of months, the past couple of months, with the car not starting, or it would almost always start, but I'd have to, I'd have to work at it a little bit. And so for the last couple of months, I've been working through different possibilities, different things that that could be. I've replaced fuses and relays, and I got a new battery a couple of weeks ago, and things seemed to be good. I think I got everything fixed. And then this morning and this afternoon happened. Luckily, I have a portable jump starter battery thing. Here it is, it is the Hulkman 8.5. I'll put a link to it on, uh, on Amazon in the video description. I, ha I bought this originally for the Yukon, and then of course I crashed the Yukon, and so I've been using it with the Land Cruiser and it works really well. I think that that, one of those things, doesn't have to be that exact one, but something like that, a portable jump starter thing, and a spare tire are probably the two most important emergency things you should have with your car. So anyway, I pulled that out, I was able to, to get going again, but as I was driving, I noticed that weird things were happening, like the the electronics weren't working in the car. I could tell that just the, the battery wasn't getting charged. I think that was just the main the main issue. And so I had other plans, other things I wanted to see and do today, but I thought, you know what? I need to get this fixed. I can't have this keep happening. So I drove to Farmington, which is the largest city in this part of New Mexico. I went there, I found a mechanic that was open, that was willing to take a look at it. He pulled out his, his diagnostic tools and was like checking the, the wiring, checking the battery and everything. And, he spent about 15 or 20 minutes trying to figure out what the problem was, and he was stumped too at first. But then he wiggled the connector, like the, where the, the wire goes onto the battery, and he, and he could like move it around. I saw him do it. It was not snugly on there. So, long story short, he tightened that up, and here we are. I was able to, to get dinner there. I got, went to Chipotle in Farmington, and now I'm out in the on the plains here in, in oil country and i'm exhausted also i went to walmart in town and got a little whisk broom because my car is just a disaster the the mud and the sand from the last several days have just destroyed the inside of my car here so i'm hoping to clean up a little bit once i wrap up here once i finish talking to you guys but even that i mean that's that's much better so Back to Chaco Canyon. Neat place, really, really neat place. It is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. I don't think I mentioned that earlier, but definitely worth a visit. It is kind of in the middle of nowhere. You do have to make a trip specifically for that. It's not really on the way to anything, but it definitely is worth the detour. And that hike today was a lot of fun. Not an especially difficult hike. I mean, it was eight miles long, so kind of long, but there weren't big ups and downs or anything like that. The, uh, the river crossing probably isn't something that you'll need to worry about most of the year. And that supernova was super, super cool. I'm really 
glad I was finally able to see that after years of wanting to go there. I can finally cross that one off my list. And Penasco Blanco, that, that great house at the end of the trail, also super cool. And there was like no one out there. I didn't see anyone as I was hiking to those ruins and I saw exactly one guy as I was hiking back to the parking lot. And the parking lot was full. Like there were people on other hikes looking at other ruins in the area, but for some reason, that particular hike, maybe because of its length, uh, people just weren't doing, but definitely worth doing. And I'm gonna wrap this up now. I've got some, got a lot of tidying up to do. Let me show you what my car looks like on the outside here. I don't think it's ever looked this nasty and ugly before. It's like it's, it's been crying boogers. Like it's just so nasty. But we do what we can. We work with the conditions. And the conditions have made these last few videos a bit of a struggle, but I've still had a great time and I hope you guys have enjoyed them too. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think. Let me know what your favorite part was. Let me know if you have any questions and I'll see you in the next one. Be sure to check out Adventure Know How, my new site where you can gain access to a map of all of my free campsites, plus monthly bonus videos that you won't find anywhere else. Learn more at adventureknowhow.com. And for links to everything else SUV RVing related, visit suvrving.com. Links to these sites and more will be in the video description.